Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Emily Su. And I'm Joyce Wu. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Chaos and arrests in Mong Kok as protesters clash with police enforcing court orders to clear road blockades. Suspect arrested after eight people injured in acid attack at Cafe de Coral restaurants in Wong Tai Sin. U.S. city of Ferguson hit by worst rioting ever as grand jury decides not to charge white policemen for killing black teenager. It's been a day of chaos in Mong Kok after thousands of police officers moved in to help bailiffs enforcing a court order to clear protest blockades on Argyle Street. More than 30 people were arrested and three officers injured in the clashes that marked the first major effort to clear the road blockades that have paralyzed one of Hong Kong's busiest districts for two months. Protesters have now been pushed back to Portland Street where they were locked in a standoff with police after more scuffles there. ATV's Raymond Yeung reports. <laughs> Under police escort, bailiffs and their assistants arrived in Mong Kok just after 9 this morning to execute a court injunction to remove protest blockades. They were targeting a westbound stretch of Argyle Street between Tong Choi and Portland Streets. After the bailiffs and the lawyer representing the minibus group that secured the injunction informed the protesters of their intentions, workers moved in to dismantle the barricades at 10.30 a.m. The operation was smooth as protesters only observed from a distance and did not interfere. During the execution of the injunction order, any unclaimed plot, uh, properties found on the way shall be considered as abandoned items and rubbish. One by one, workers removed tents and a large pavilion. That continued until protesting student leaders and a few pan-democratic lawmakers stopped workers from taking away a stack of wooden pallets they were using as a makeshift stage. Yvonne Leung from the Federation of Students then argued with the lawyer over the terms of the clearance. The students were apparently trying to stall the operation using legal red tape. And it seemed to work. The operation ground to a halt as bailiffs found themselves surrounded by a growing number of protesters. After unsuccessful calls for the occupiers to give way, police stepped in and took strong action at 3 p.m. following a verbal warning. Scores of officers, some with riot gear, formed a human chain and forcefully pushed protesters away from the junction of Argyle Street and Nathan Road. But caught in the chaos were dozens of journalists and cameramen who had nowhere to go as they were trapped between police and protesters. More than a dozen arrests were made. In the midst of the chaos, an ATV cameraman was warned by officers to move back or face arrest. Police raised red flags warning protesters they would use force. After nearly half an hour of pushing, shoving and shouting, police managed to seize control of Argyle Street between Nathan Road and Langham Place. That section, a main thoroughfare for buses, finally reopened to westbound traffic after nearly two months. But protesters retreated to nearby Portland Street, paving the way for more standoffs and scuffles with police, which lasted into the night. And all this was supposed to be the easy part. Many protesters are calling today's clearance a small defeat, as their main base on Nathan Road remains intact. Under a separate court injunction, the stretch of Nathan Road between Argyle and Dundas streets is due to be cleared tomorrow, with lawmakers already expecting trouble. Today is for Argyle Street, tomorrow is Leighton Road. You know, tomorrow will be more uh, difficult for the clearance, meaning it's a bigger area, more people, and uh, some people there probably will resist stronger. Claudia Mo from the Civic Party insisted it was far from the end of the civil disobedience campaign for greater democracy. Oh no, I wouldn't say that. I mean, uh, uh, the spirit of this uh, umbrella movement will carry on forever. It's been etched, not just uh, in our mind, but in our heart. Most people in Hong Kong have had enough of what's happening in Hong Kong and welcome the clearance of the street blockades. But it may be still too early to see this as the beginning of the end of the Occupy movement. Raymond Yeung, ATV News. Earlier today, Chief Executive Lin Chen Ying expressed full confidence in the ability of police to help bailiffs clear protest sites. He also insists the door is still open for talks with protest leaders. 
Before leaving for a three-day visit to South Korea this afternoon, Chief Executive Leung Chunying urged pro-democracy protesters not to obstruct bailiffs clearing barricades in Mong Kok. He called on demonstrators to cooperate with officers of the court and end what he called their obviously illegal sit-in. Earlier, he gave police a vote of confidence. I believe officers can do their jobs properly, Leung said before his weekly cabinet meeting this morning. He repeated his usual line that he was willing to listen to public views on universal suffrage as long as they stuck to the basic law and the framework imposed by Beijing. His number two, Carrie Lam, echoed his sentiments. Speaking in Beijing, where she attended a forum on economic cooperation between the capital and the SAR, the chief secretary said Hong Kong residents and shop owners could breathe a sigh of relief after nearly two months of blockades. She said the door to further talks with student leaders behind the pro-democracy protests was never completely shut. But she insisted there should not be unrealistic conditions, such as demanding Beijing withdraw its restrictive framework on the 2017 chief executive poll. Lam advised students to distance themselves from radical forces that may have infiltrated the pro-democracy movement. When asked if the government would initiate any clear-out operation on its own, Lam said that it would depend on the effectiveness of the various injunctions already granted against the street seizures. She said no deadline has been set to complete a report to the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office to reflect sentiments in the SAR since the protests began, because the situation remains fluid. Lam refused to say whether the second round of consultation on political reform, which was due to start this quarter, will be delayed due to the mass protests. But she admitted the demonstrations would distract the focus of the consultation. In a related development, the chief executive criticized pan-Democrat lawmakers who have been filibustering the government's funding requests as part of their non-cooperation campaign. Opposition legislators had urged the government to prioritize its bills so that the ones dealing with livelihood issues would be debated and approved first. But Leung said other bills dealing with social infrastructure and economic development are equally important. Eight people, including a four-year-old boy, have been injured in two acid attacks at Cafe de Coral restaurants in Wong Tai Sin. Police have arrested a suspect, a 46-year-old man who was apparently angry about the restaurant service. Eight people, restaurant staff and customers were sent to Queen Elizabeth Hospital after they were injured in two shocking acid attacks in Wong Tai Sin. Witnesses said a man entered a Cafe de Coral restaurant in San Po Kong at around 1 p.m. and flung a bottle of acid at terrified diners. He then went to another outlet of the popular fast food chain in Si Wan Shan, where he carried out the second attack. Most of the victims suffered burns on their faces and arms after they were splashed with a corrosive chemical, believed to be a drain cleaner. The youngest was a four-year-old boy, but his injuries were not severe. Thea Grip Zi Ching public housing estate as officers with shields and helmets arrived to track down the culprit. A large area near the two restaurants was cordoned off as police searched for the 46-year-old suspect, who apparently had a grievance about the service. The yeah, manager of the, the shop or the restaurant uh, gave chase and then lost sight somewhere here. So we believe the culprit may, uh, went up to one of the buildings. We strongly believe that he's targeting the, the uh, staff because uh, when he threw the corrosive, he's mainly throw at the staff but accidentally uh, split into the customer. At around 4 p.m., police found the suspect, a man with long hair and carrying a pink backpack. We strongly believe he is one of residents living in this estate, so we deploy officers to lay and boost in the vicinity in these few blocks. Eventually, we find this wonder person appear. Officers say the suspect did not resist arrest, has no history of mental problems and is currently unemployed. Police found more suspicious material in his flat but did not give details. Overseas, the U.S. city of Ferguson has been hit by the worst rioting ever, following a grand jury's decision not to press charges against a white policeman who shot and killed an unarmed black teenager. Dozens have been arrested after angry mobs went on the rampage in an orgy of looting, burning and gunfire. Gunshots rang out as the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson was transformed into a war zone. The rioting erupted just minutes after it was announced that a Missouri grand jury had decided not to prosecute a white policeman who shot and killed unarmed black teenager Michael Brown back in August. Police vehicles were attacked.
Officers fired tear gas but were unable to stop angry crowds from setting fire to cars and buildings. Businesses across Ferguson burned well into the night in the worst outbreak of rioting the city has ever seen. Looters took advantage of the breakdown in law and order to force their way into stores and malls. The police response to the latest chaos mirrored their reaction to the protests that erupted in Ferguson in the days after 18-year-old Brown was killed. And in a repeat of recent U.S. history, the groundswell of anger by minorities angry with what they see as persecution by well-armed white police burst across the U.S. with people taking to the streets to demand justice. In Chicago, demonstrators braved the call to get their voices heard. Black parents don't deserve to see their kids die in the street. I'm tired of seeing black mothers bury their babies. I'm tired of being worried of my brother in these streets. I'm tired of being scared of myself. In New York, demonstrators questioned how Darren Wilson, the white policeman who fired 12 shots at Brown, was able to escape indictment. He could be judged not guilty or guilty if he did receive a fair trial, but there's certainly enough evidence to prosecute him. The protests reached the gates of the White House. After a short march, demonstrators held a moment of silence, complying with a request by Brown's family. In a late-night appeal, President Barack Obama called for restraint and reminded the nation that under the rule of law, the grand jury's decision has to be respected. There are Americans who agree with it, and there are Americans who are deeply disappointed, even angry. It's an understandable reaction. But I join Michael's parents in asking anyone who protests this decision to do so peacefully. The outrage came after the prosecutor in St. Louis said members of the grand jury, nine whites and three blacks, saw no reason to charge Wilson. The physical and scientific evidence examined by the grand jury, combined with the witness statements supported and substantiated by that physical evidence, tells the accurate and tragic story of what happened. Many witnesses to the shooting of Michael Brown made statements inconsistent with other statements they made and also conflicting with the physical evidence. Some witnesses said Brown had raised his hands in surrender when Wilson fired at him. But the officer's supporters accused Brown of being the aggressor, saying he tried to seize Wilson's gun and that the policeman opened fire in self-defense. The prosecutor's comments are not expected to go down well with many Americans of color. Just yesterday, police in Cleveland, Ohio, shot and killed a 12-year-old boy who was brandishing a toy gun. In Chicago, veteran civil rights campaigner Jesse Jackson captured the mood of the disgruntled. Tonight is a sad commentary of an historical pattern. Unarmed black teen shot and killed, and it is seen as justifiable homicide. Brown's family expressed profound disappointment that the killer of their child will not face the consequence of his actions. As Americans protested, the fires of Ferguson burning bright into the night were a reminder that despite decades of struggle, the U.S. still has some way to go to become a truly united state. A British parliamentary delegation has cancelled a visit to Shanghai at the last minute because of a row over Hong Kong's Occupy movement. The MPs are protesting after Beijing denied a visa to one of them for supporting the pro-democracy campaign. ATV's Arthur Akula reports. A group of British members of parliaments led by Labour politician Peter Maddelson was set to leave London today for a three-day visit to Shanghai for the UK-China Leadership Forum held every two years. But according to British newspaper The Guardian, the visit was cancelled at the last minute after Beijing refused to grant a visa to one of them. Richard Graham, a former diplomat who was posted at the British Embassy in Beijing and consulate in Macau for four years, led a debate last month on the ongoing pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. During the debate in Westminster, he raised concerns about possible breaches by Beijing of the Sino-British Joint Declaration. He said Britain had a duty to uphold the principles of the Declaration signed in 1984, including maintaining an independent judiciary, free press, free speech, and the freedom to demonstrate. He stressed that Britain risked colluding in the city's gradual decline of these freedoms if it allowed them to be curtailed. 
Beijing's embassy in London demanded the chairman of the UK Parliament's China Group make a statement clarifying his remarks. But the MPs responded with an ultimatum. Grant Graham his visa or they would cancel their entire trip. UK Foreign Office Minister Hugo Squire was apparently involved in talks to try to save the visit. An agreement could not be reached with the embassy by 5 p.m. local time yesterday and the visit was axed. During last month's debate, Graham had also given a reassurance that external forces were not responsible for the Hong Kong protests, insisting those taking part are not ancient colonial sentimentalists, but a new generation with its own agenda. Tensions have been high over what the central government claims is growing interference by the UK and Hong Kong politics, which Beijing insists are an internal affair. In July, Democratic Party founder Martin Lee and former Chief Secretary Anson Chan addressed a public inquiry session of the British Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee, which was looking into whether Beijing is honoring the terms of the joint declaration. They voiced fears about Beijing undermining the SCR's autonomy and violating the one country, two systems policy. Arthur Rakula, ATV News. The Philippine government has lifted a ban on nine Hong Kong journalists after causing outrage here by blacklisting them for qu shouting questions at President Benigno Aquino. But Hong Kong was not officially informed of the U-turn and only found out through the media. ATV's Wen Wang reports. Just days after Hong Kong learned that nine of its journalists had been blacklisted by the Philippines, the ban was suddenly lifted today. Media reports quoted Manila's Immigration Bureau in confirming that the ban had been lifted on the recommendation of the National Intelligence Coordinating Agency, which had originally requested the blacklist. The blacklist was first made public last Thursday when a Now TV cameraman found himself barred from entering the Philippines for a holiday. He was shown a copy of a 6th of June order barring him and eight other Hong Kong journalists from entry. They were accused of heckling Philippine President Benigno Aquino at the APEC summit in Bali last year. They had shouted questions at him regarding an apology and compensation for the Manila hostage tragedy of 2010. Philippine authorities said today the ban was no longer necessary as President Aquino was not subjected to aggressive questioning at this year's APEC summit in Beijing. The blacklist has caused outrage in Hong Kong, where journalists are used to shouting questions at officials and the Manila tragedy is still a sore point. In a reflection of the lack of communication between the Philippine and Hong Kong governments, Chief Executive Lan Chen Ying said this morning he had yet to receive official confirmation of the lifting of the ban and only learned of it from news reports. Unconfirmed reports also said the head of Manila's Immigration Bureau might resign over the controversy. Wen Wang, ATV News. A U.S. military nurse is fighting to keep his job after refusing to force feed prisoners on a hunger strike in Guantanamo Bay. But first in our world wrap, global powers are optimistic about an agreement, although talks on Iran's nuclear program have been extended. Foreign Minister Wang Yi says progress is being made in talks on Iran's nuclear program, although formal discussions have been extended for seven months. China was among the six countries that had been negotiating with Tehran in Austria but they were unable to reach a deal before a deadline expired. These talks aren't going to suddenly get easier just because we extend them. They're tough, and they've been tough, and they're going to stay tough. But like China, both the U.S. and Iran are confident that a deal is close. An agreement will end all economic sanctions against Iran, which has insisted that its nuclear program is designed to produce atomic energy, not weapons. The UN has marked International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. During a debate, Israel accused Sweden of recognizing Palestine to gain Arab support for a Security Council seat. Nations on the Security Council should have sense, sensitivity and sensibility. While well, the Swedish government has shown no sense, no sensitivity and no sensibility. Just nonsense. The Swedish delegate hit back. The Swedish recognition of the state of Palestine aims at making the parties less unequal and to improve the prospects for a negotiated final status agreement. We 
UN Chief Ban Ki-moon added his voice to the debate, predicting that the number of countries recognizing Palestine will increase. An American military nurse could lose his job because he has refused to force-feed hunger strikers at the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. Many inmates at the prison in Cuba have been fasting for years to protest against allegations that they are terrorists. The nurse is the first to refuse to force-feed prisoners. If your commanding officer says to you, I want you to turn to the person next to you and shoot him in the head, you could say no. And that's not a crime, that's not disobeying a lawful order, because it's not a lawful order. A military board will decide whether the nurse should be discharged.